People's Platform. Good evening and welcome to the show. Now, the multiple crises in Sri Lanka have significantly impacted the socio-economic landscape and created new pockets of vulnerable communities across the country. However, Sri Lanka has since embarked on a journey of recovery and revitalization. Now, what does this look like for the landscape of food security and nutrition? Let's have the conversation. I'm pleased to welcome to the studio Visaka Tilkaratna. She is a professional in food technology and nutrition. Nutrition. Good evening and welcome Visaka. Good evening. Um, Visaka, uh, to start things off, uh, could you take us through some of the root causes of food insecurity and malnourishment over and above uh, poverty, lack of education about nutrition, environmental factors, uh, policy uh, factors and a lack of access? Very, very good uh, question and root causes actually have to be addressed because that is the generation of program and policy, the basis, you know, of why things are as they are. Uh, actually, if redressed, only will sustainably give us solutions. So, uh, the popular, you know, uh, causes you have listed. Uh, but one of the, you know, outstanding, you know, remarkable, or should I say, negatively remarkable aspects of Sri Lanka is that in agriculture, we have been, you know, starting to talk about mainstreaming nutrition in agriculture only recently. So before that, there were various campaigns with various names and all agricultural production enhancement was kind of lumped under that topic of api hadamu, ratavavamu, nagamu and so on. But there has not been a strategic approach to looking at metabolic demand and looking at other social factors, you know, and then various agencies are doing their best to increase productivity, but that has become stagnant. So I would say uh, the agricultural planning side, according to metabolic demand and other variables, is one of the root causes of, you know, food insecurity. Um, Visaka, we have to be guided by the science, by the data. Uh, a cursory reading of the National Nutrition and Micronutrients Survey in Sri Lanka 2022 shows that Kurunagala has been identified as one of the most undernourished regions in Sri Lanka. Could you take us through some of the key findings and literature that is encompassed in this report? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, good report after, you know, many years and it touches on multiple, you know, micronutrient deficiencies. Um, and it's interesting that, as you said, Kurunagala is identified. Kurunagala is the district with the largest number of divisions in this country and with larger variations according to proximity and development uh, as a result. So you will have a very arid, you know, area in Kurunagala and then you will have a fairly intermediate kind of a zone, though it's, you know, identified in the ecological zone of, you know, dry intermediate. That is one of the things. And also the inequities of development. In the districts with large numbers of such divisions, this variation is very high. Now, to talk about the evidence, it is very difficult because the causal analysis of why these things are as they are has really not been analyzed in the recent past. In early years, uh, especially the World Food Program introduced the concept of vulnerability analysis mapping, taking into consideration all indicators and then seeing upon overlaying these indicators what were the most, you know, aggressively undernourished areas. Today, that exercise continues, but unfortunately, there is a kind of a disconnect in the agricultural planning process and vulnerability. And the third pillar that really should be is land zoning, seeing which land piece fits the crop the best. And in Sri Lanka, we have a lot of these things, but these are attempted in bits and bobs. It all has to fit into one plan very frankly. So I would say, to give you a short answer, the causal analysis is not yet done. And without the causal analysis, we cannot plan. 
currently the government has you know started to engage and it's a very heartening you know uh, piece of news that the multi-sector action plan on nutrition has commenced but that plan too needs a lot of situational assessments to actually bring the correct kind of solutions according to the causes. Right. Uh, Visaka, now certain groups of the population are disproportionately uh, affected by food insecurity and malnutrition. Um, talk us through the uh, cultural, social, economic factors that sort of intersect and exacerbate the situation so that we can better understand the realities. Yes. Uh, now, when you talk about social and uh, economic groups, the, and this, we have the evidence of this, the most vulnerable are the landless laborers of the rural sector, agriculture sector, who have no access of, you know, to their own land. And the others are, of course, the low income settlements in the urban areas. Thirdly, plantations. Uh, I would not talk about the plantations in the same way as there are a number of initiatives to support the plantation community. However, if I just contain myself first to the plantations, the cost of living also defeats them because it is difficult for them to grow their own food due to the lack of space, home gardens in the houses that, you know, are clustered together. Uh, to, you know, bring about solutions, the plantation, you know, Human Development Trust and the plantation companies are kind of attempting, you know, to redress the shelter issue as well as the idea, you know, abiding with the idea of community gardens to grow their own food. However, uh, the income which needs improvement, the, even though many family members are earning in each family, and versus the cost of food is, you know, something that is quite contradictory. In the rural areas, yes, fruits and vegetables can be grown, but the new complaint uh, for the last, you know, five years or ten years is uh, animal, you know, or pest attack or animal attack, especially on fruit trees. Uh, so this is now, you know, getting to be quite a major issue. But there are solutions which need to be thought out carefully and done in a sustained and planned manner. Yes, vegetables are available, but the defeating factor is the excessive cost of animal protein. And this is not only for the rural areas, even for the urban so the quality of protein in the diet is very poor. It mostly comes from coconut and rice and animal protein is something beyond the reach of many. However, behavior change communication also has not really taken off in a systematic way where we teach people to make low cost meals, substitute meals, which can be of quite good nutrition value. So this is a kind of a nexus between affordability and also education and demand, as well as, again, the planning for agriculture and food security. So initiatives like that aren't really rocket science, no? They can be done quite easily. Quite easily, and I always say that I'm in a field where though we have cutting-edge research, as you very well said, it's not rocket science. But, I, you know, it is also a matter of egos. And I have referred to this in previous programs, in this very same studio, in this very same, you know, station. And that is when advice on planning is given or suggested, there, number one, there is a, a reluctance to accept. And here again and again, I flog the attempt of the Nutrition Society of Sri Lanka uh, exactly eight to ten years ago where it was proposed to have a 10-year plan on food security, taking into consideration metabolic demand and, as I said, sociological variations and, you know, other economic variations, tourism, etc., and to have a methodology to plan your food basket, first of all, and then you look at, you know, export agriculture and so on. But at the time, the agriculture ministry, and, I, and still I don't see an acceptance that this very plan is taken on, uh, what is heartening perhaps that there are few professionals who now talk about, you know, planning for the number of human beings that we carry on this land of ours. Recently, the UNDP uh, released a report, Understanding Multidimensional Vulnerabilities, uh, which found that 55.7% of Sri Lankans are multidimensionally vulnerable. Now, 
this is a shocking um, statistic. But Visaka, uh, um, there also appears to be a massive disconnect between the haves and the have-nots, as it were. You go into any five-star hotel and look at their buffet, um, it's packed to the brim. Hotels are packed to the brim, and that's fantastic for the hotel industry. That's, that's fabulous. However, um, there's a certain percentage of our population that doesn't realize that there is a massive percentage of our population that goes hungry, that is malnourished. So speak to us about this disconnect, which is um, quite um, disturbing. I think uh, very rightly UNDP, you know, has done its job of measuring multidimensional poverty and also, as you know, the Human Development Index report or the Human Development Report also is produced by uh, UNDP and, um, the, and UNICEF also produces the, you know, a report on children every year and, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, UN, the UN family has been flagging that you know, it's Sri Lanka overall has become a newly developed country, but we dropped one level in income from a kind of a newly developed middle income country. We are now coming to like lower middle income. Now, the cause of this has been clearly shown. That is, the disparities of income and development within intra-country disparity. So, about uh, you know, 10% of the population earns about 80 to 90% of the income in the country. This is the issue. So, as you very rightly said, when you see the hotels, you see that 10% and then you see the people outside. 80 to 90% are struggling. Now, we really need to take steps on issues of um, distributing income more evenly. We really need to look at labor regulations, we need to look at, you know, minimum income that people earn, you know, which has to be a mandatory, you know, figure. Now, if you take the Scandinavian countries and you take a kind of a, you know, uh, let's say the equivalent of a clerical staff and the CEO, the CEO, if the CEO earns, earns 100 rupees, uh, the clerical staff will earn about 60 to 70. So, the disparity is very low. Mm. In Sri Lanka, we really do not flag these issues. These are not discussed in parliament. Unfortunately, the members of parliament, except a very few, I don't want to be unfair by everyone, but a majority, have no understanding of fundamental you know, causes and, and planning. So, we really need to take a stand. We need to have a plan for the country, first of all. A plan that is known by not only decision makers and parliamentarians, but even the common man. If somebody asks the question, you know, what is your development goal for the next 10 years, the man on the street should be involved and know about it. And that is where demand comes in, demand for equity. So I would say this is deeply rooted and we really need to, you know, root it out. All right. We are in conversation with uh, Visaka Tilakaratna. We are going for a break. With People's Platform. Singharaja, Sri Lanka's precious world heritage. Singers battling for one crown. Shakti Crown. Oh, 
நல்ல வாயம சூதானம் பெண்ணு ஜாதிக்க <laughs> मेहबरा साथी दिन अवल उदयसन एकुनाडा टीवी वन टीवी फॉर लाइफ यूएस कंडक्ट्स आईएसआर फ्लाइट डिमो फॉर श्रीलंकन मिलिट्री एन सेवेंटी सेवेन हंड्रेड बॉम्बारिया एयरक्राफ्ट बाय यूएस डीओडी इन रातमलाने फॉर ट्रेनिंग Sri Lanka failed to meet 33% of IMF commitments due by end of February claims Verite research. IMF should oppose restrictions on freedom says Human Rights Watch. Energy connectivity with India will prepare Sri Lanka to be an energy exporter says Indian Envoy. Bodies of victims of shootings in Pitigala and Ambalanguda moved to their residences. <laughs> Police chief assures justice. TV One, TV for life. platform food security and nutrition is the topic of discussion today i'm in conversation with uh, visaka tilakaratta um, visaka this next issue it has come under the radar uh, everyone's radar but nothing is being done uh, the midday meal in schools the financial allocations for it have remained the same across the years i mean isn't it common sense an egg used to cost about 25 rupees now it's about 57 uh, why are we doing such a disservice by our children i mean it's i don't know i i really don't know how to pose this question how how do you respond to this it is actually you know uh, i would use a very strong word and again to be very frank this is actually diabolical because if you actually see the few who are you know excessively supported and i mean you know the variations of convoys meals and trips overseas luxury vehicles especially of those who are supposed to serve us as volunteers and when you look at that and you look at as you said the midday meal you are actually enraged now the objective of the midday meal is not strictly nutrition around the world according to the norms it is really to retain the attention span of students get them to go to school um, and also you know uh, actually get children enrolled in school of course sri lanka has no issue with enrollment but the issue of 57 rupees now we should either do this properly or scrap it it's done half heartedly for the popular vote unfortunately and our politicians make fancy speeches about everything that the people are going to get however it is very simple sonali if you want to give a child a proper meal the basic minimum it costs 100 rupees minimum if it is mass produced okay now today uh, the medical research institute and various you know agroeconomical you know institutes have come out and said that especially after this crisis for a family of four you need 52000 rupees minimum for the food basket and we we are not you know saying that this is a highly nutritious food basket either no. so now if you think that there are two children in this family and you divide up the 52000 and one the share of one is 13000 rupees for three meals hmm. 
and then you, you divide the 13,000 by 3 and you arrive, arrive at something like 3,000 and that is 100 rupees a day. So very simply we have to advocate and I am part of these networks you know we are going to advocate that this has to really be improved. Uh, can we also look at the barriers faced by vulnerable communities in accessing nutritious food? Uh, one barrier, of, of course, you know, the obvious one is affordability, but also uh, the second one is attitude and lack of prioritization. Mm. Third is uh, not having practical uh, knowledge. I wouldn't even say knowledge, but practices of preparing food. Uh, I, I don't want to be critical, but a priority in a household is usually, you know, household asset creation. Of course, education is also emphasized, which is a good thing. However, there is overemphasis also sometimes. And then, of course, on gold jewelry, which is a you know, key asset, of course, it can be pawned and it's a source of, you know, temporary income. So uh, we really need to address this in two ways. One is enhancing livelihoods and income. Uh, one is behavior change communication. Just now, the Ministry of Health Nutrition Division has prepared a little booklet, uh, how to you know achieve your food-based dietary guidelines, which are mandated by the country, uh, through low-cost and substitute means. Right. But a book is only a book, and we need to have everyone talking about it actively to internalize it among the community. Mm. Um. Let's also d discuss the importance of developing targeted interventions and policies to address food insecurity and malnutrition effectively. Yes. Uh, now, even though the children are the most important segment as they have a long way to go and to grow, uh, for your question, let me uh, take the example of the neglected, the elderly, mm. for instance. Now, targeted approaches for the elderly and we talk about, as I told you, the multi-sector action plan on nutrition nationally. Now, by the way, we are doing training to send it to the districts and to the divisions. How do you actually target the elderly through the multi-sector approach to address multi-causality? Now, the elderly, re a recent report says that a higher percentage in any age group taking the elderly, they are the poorest. Actually, over 50 to 60 percent of the elderly do not have a regular means of income. So either we address pension schemes, social protection, that has to go before anything. And the elderly are also sick and the, a large you know, amount of their income goes on medication. So we really need to look at uh, food and you know, a, a reasonable cost of food, income for the elderly, then also procurement. Sometimes they find it difficult to access. Mm. So what are the plans? I mean, is it meals on wheels or is it that a cart, a mobile vegetable or food cart comes around? Number, number four, processing and, and cooking. Are they able to do it? Who is going to look after? Now we have the public health midwife to look after the pregnant and lactating mothers mainly and the under fives and of course family planning, etc., etc. Mm. For a long time, it has been suggested by the bureaucrats, especially in social development and mental health, that we have a social worker for the elderly. So if I take the target group, you can see we have just mentioned the basic minimum. But without a multi-sector approach, we cannot really address any age group. Sure. Um, how can community-based approaches um, help in this initiative? Yes. Now, in all these initiatives, we have a number of committees that are mandated again at community level. The village multi-sector committee on nutrition, the child development committees at different levels, etc. However, most of the time, they are without a terms or reference on mm -hmm. what to do. They are not capacitated on the minimum that they have to do. It is actually the good sense and the good heart of our people that sees that a villager does not go hungry or even a dog or cat mm -hmm. does not go hungry. But all these things are mandated by policy and needs to be activated. There are very good approaches. Uh, Community-based organizations, NGOs want to do their best, but there has to be some sort of a concerted plan which says, look, come onto this platform, you take this share of the plan. So we need to get right down to grassroots and also revitalize. There's a very good uh, uh, you know, circular and a plan by the government, again not activated, on revitalizing uh, 
food, uh, food security and nutrition committees and centers at village level. Now, those would ensure self-sufficiency at least to look after all those who need it at the village level. Again, it is on paper but needs to be activated. Wow. Um, so, what must the government now do in this respect? The government has to look at optimizing resources, number one. Number two, to have a proper plan, not only for nutrition, for all important sectors like Malaysia and all these countries, which even India, which launches 10-year plans and there is a very good monitoring and evaluation mechanism. Mm. So we really need to strictly monitor and evaluate. So there are three pillars, planning, resource, resourcing, monitoring and evaluation. If that is there, people will get into action. Um, and finally, Visaka, um, with respect to uh, food insecurity and nutrition, I mean, how, how terri terribly are we doing? What more needs to be done? To be fair, we expected a very difficult crisis. But somehow, due to various natural and other you know, factors, mm. especially even philanthropy, and even though I do not agree with cash transfers, done by the development agencies, that social protection helped. Mm. So we did not come into that crisis situation that is urgent and sudden and acute. But as I said again in an earlier program, we are in a lingering emergency. Okay. So underneath the surface, there are lots of gaps and lapses and deprivations. So as I said, we need to, in any community, earmark the most vulnerable, and all these multi-sector activities have to be targeted to the most vulnerable. In Sri Lanka, at any moment, there are at least 25 to 30 percent households who need help with food security, with income, and you know, and, and therefore to address their you know over or under even overnutrition sometimes is a, 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 a symptom of a poor household that is eating empty calories. Okay. Now we are not talking about the you know fancy richer families that are eating maybe nutritious but maybe rich food and they are getting fat. But there are fat people also, like in the United States, amongst mm -hmm. the Hispanics and the African Americans, you get a lot of obesity. Mm -hmm. So likewise, people are eating empty calories and not really balancing with the fruit and vegetable and protein and you know the fiber that is required to digest, etc. Mm -hmm. So in the same household, you can have the undernourished and the overnourished due to empty calories. Is there a holistic uh, plan uh, that captures all these aspects and all the agencies that are supposed to uh, work on food security and nutrition? Yes, it's as I mentioned earlier, we have the multi-sector action plan on nutrition that is driven by the presidential secretariat for many years. Mm. Uh, it has worked sometimes, sometimes it has been dormant due to crisis and, and various you know, lack of commitment as well, I must say. Okay. But now there's a resurg resurgence of interest purely because there's an op opportunity and there's a need to improve nutrition. Now, this uh, multi-sector action plan, national plan, is now being uh, planned at the district level. So bringing the outcomes at national level down to the districts. And at the moment, we have started to capacity build district level officers to do these plans, which will also translate down to the divisions. So that is the holistic plan which has the multi-causal approach, uh, and I would suggest, Sonali, that six months down the line, or three months down the line, your, your, the media agencies have a very important role to play in development communications. Mm. Bring the policy makers and ask them every three months, what has happened with these multi-sector action plans? Mm. That would be the best monitoring and evaluation. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This was most comprehensive. Visakha Tilakaratna. Thank you for watching us. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night. Oh, <laughs>